Good afternoon. Given the point that we reached in proceedings yesterday and that we have a number of groups to debate before we reach the next line, under Rule 9.8.5a, I am minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the next time limit be extended by up to two hours. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I am moved. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the time limit for debate on amendments be extended by up to two hours. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The first item of business is the continuation of Stage 3 proceedings on the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should, members should have the Bill is amended at Stage 2, that is Scottish Parliament Bill 13A. The marshalled list the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds and thereafter I will allow a period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons or enter RTS in the chat as soon as possible after I call the group. I would ask members to now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. We move to group 10. Point of order, Douglas Ross. I'm grateful, presiding officer, uh, for accepting the point of order. I wonder if I could seek your guidance on the official report of this parliament. The official report is a written record of what is said in public meetings of the Scottish Parliament and its committees. Not my words, but the words of the official report website hosted by the Scottish Parliament. Uh, last night, the Deputy Presiding Officer suspended uh, the sitting to, and I quote uh, the official record, uh, we will have to clear the galleries now. We will suspend the meeting for a few minutes while that happens. The official record states that at 1824, meeting suspended. At 1900, eh, on resuming, eh, the Deputy Presiding Officer invited members eh, to resume their seats. Eh, in the intervening period, the Deputy Presiding Officer had begun proceedings again. I then made a point of order. That is totally removed from the official record. Whoa. Not a single note of it. At that point, I was urging the Deputy Presiding Officer to make it clear that if people have been unruly, they should be removed, but people who had sat through silently and listened to the debate should not be removed. That point was, I think, accepted by the Deputy Presiding Officer. We then had further discussions because I pointed out, on the record, I thought, that people had been threatened with arrest if they did not leave the public gallery. Again, there is no mention of that whatsoever in the official report, which I go back, is supposed to be a record of what was said in public meetings of the Scottish Parliament. Later on, my colleague Jeremy Balfour eh, said in a point of order, I seek some clarification about the question that my colleague Douglas Ross asked just before the suspension in connection with who can use the gallery. But anyone trying to read what I said in response to what Mr Balfour said will find no record of it in the official report. So how can we possibly have a situation where there is an incomplete official report for an important session of this parliament? I thank Mr Ross for his point of order. Um, my own understanding was that proceedings were suspended, but I will look into the matter that Mr Ross raises and I will be back in touch with Mr Ross. Now, we move to Group 10, Certificates Obtained by Fraud. I call Amendment 108 in the name of Janie, Jamie Green, grouped with Amendments 110, 114, 115, 116, 138 and 139. Jamie Green to move Amendment 108 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, can I first of all place on record my thanks to uh, colleagues and, of course, more importantly, the staff of the Parliament who aided and abetted us so diligently last night into our late sitting. Uh, and it is without, without them we would not be able to do the jobs we do. And I wanted to place that on record. Um,
and I'll try not to speak to keep them here till midnight, so uh, that's the good news. Um, I'd also like to welcome people back to the public gallery. We are an open parliament, and it is important that we are a parliament of the people, for the people as well. So, uh, This group of amendments, Group 10, uh, which we didn't get through to last night, uh, are largely centred around uh, the concept of certificates that are obtained by fraud. Now, those of you who were here in the debate yesterday will know I made comments around what I felt was a much-needed compromise in this piece of legislation, compromise that was notably absent at stage one, given that many concerns yesterday over the many hours were raised uh, about uh, use of this new simplified process for nefarious purpose, purposes. A number of amendments were proposed by various members to that effect and were voted on accordingly. My running theme throughout this presiding officer has been two points in my desire to amend this bill. It's not to do so to be uh, difficult, not to uh, take advantage of it for other purposes, but simply to make the bill better. And that's a desire I think we all should share. Now, I've come to a view through that uh, desire uh, based on two themes, and that's one of compromise and one of competence. And I think those two words are recurring themes that I hope we will all bear in mind as we go through today's amendments. The issue of compromise is an important one, because without compromise, I don't feel that both sides of the argument will feel fully satisfied that they've been heard and listened to. And that is competence is equally important, because this is a stage three debate, and what we put on the face of the bill will live on the face of the bill in black and white for generations to come. So through that process, I have come to a view that the amendments, as they are currently drafted, are indeed that of compromise and competence. They are compromise because they, in my view, ensure that this new process, whatever your views on the simplicity of it, is not taken advantage of or abused. And my amendments seek to do that through a number of ways. There are six amendments in this group, four substantive and two consequential. The first one, Amendment 108, addresses an issue that was raised when introduced this concept at stage two, uh, a stage I was happy to participate in constructively. Uh, a member in uh, that debate, uh, Pauline McNeill, raised a very valid issue uh, around the definition of what a fraudulently obtained certificate might be and look like. I think actually it was quite a, ch a challenge set to me. It has been very challenging to get a well-rounded definition of what a fraudulently obtained certificate is without being so defined and limited that it actually could prevent prosecution in valid cases. My understanding is that this revised amendment, 108, is much legally clearer. 108 states that a GRC is fraudulent if the applicant knowingly makes a statutory declaration or includes information in their application that is false in a material particular. So what does that mean in practice? That is to say that an application would be fraudulent if there was relevant evidence that the court saw that was sufficient to prove that the application was fraudulent. Of course that would be a matter of the independent judiciary in the scenario of either a jury or a judge or a sheriff. But it could include, by way of example, a broad range of evidence to support that there was uh, suspicion that an application was fraudulently made. That could include a number of factors, such as the physical appearance of the offender in question, evidence from those who know the offender, names used, pronouns and prefixes used by the offender before, during and after living in the required gender period, and anything else that the court may deem appropriate. I am happy to take an intervention. Graham Simpson. Okay, thank Jamie Green. Thank Jamie Green for taking the intervention. Um, the issue I have with uh, this, this section, and I raised it at stage two, is it seems to me to be virtually impossible to prove fraud if, in order to get one of these certificates, you don't have to actually present any evidence. So if there's no evidence needed to get a certificate, how can there be a fraud committed in order to get one? What would be the fraud? For the only thing that you have to say is, I'm a man or I am a woman, and present no other evidence, what fraud can there be? Jamie Green. Well, I'm aware of a number of, uh, of other uh, amendments that were discussed around the uh, production of documentation. I, I think there is a valid point in that the 2004 Act um, does not uh, go into great detail in specifying what evidence is required to obtain a GRC. That's been the case, however, for nearly two decades. 
Uh, and nothing in this bill actually changes that. Uh, what is missing from the 2004 Act, which I hope is a point of agreement perhaps that the member will have, as others will have, is that I don't feel that it fully addressed the issue that there is the possibility, I believe it to be a low possibility, others believe it to be a greater one, that someone could use this process, whether it's the existing process or the new simplified process of statute declaration and self-identification, as it's otherwise known as, um, could be used for nefarious reasons. Now, the 2004 Act, um, I think, was weak in that respect. What I'm trying to do with this set of amendments, and I'll go on to explain some of the others and, and how it goes about that, is introduce the concept that making a false declaration is a very serious offence. Making a false statutory declaration already is an offence, but by doing so, and by using this new process to then commit further offences, that the judiciary will take that extremely seriously, and that will be manifested in another amendment that I have in this group around aggravating offences. Um, of course, we cannot consider every scenario in every court case in which this, this may pass. I, I expect the numbers to be uh, relatively low, but if they do come to pass in a court of law, it will be a matter, um, uh, a decision-making matter on, on whether they believe, uh, the court believes that um, a false, uh, false declaration was made. Uh, it, is, it should be clear to folk out there that making a statutory declaration is a very grave matter indeed, um, and a very serious uh, thing to do. And I think it's for that reason that, that we should put um, faith in the process of stat statutory declarations, one that has existed for, for generations. Um, yeah, in a second, I do want to make some progress or, or we will be here to midnight. Um, an offence uh, like this will be taken, as I said, on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it may be difficult to put specific criteria on the face of the bill because that would be counterproductive uh, because it could be then used as a definitive list uh, rather than an open one. Um, um, uh, following on from that, Amendment 114 in this group uh, creates an aggravation of an offence when a crime has been committed using a fraudulently obtained certificate. So to be clear what I mean by the aggravator, it's a concept again I introduced at Stage 2. It was rightly challenged in terms of its wording. That's the whole point of Stage 2 amendments. I've revisited it and I'm confident that as drafted at the moment, Amendment 114 tidies up uh, this, this concept. What it means is that by having a GRC and committing uh, an offence in which that offence can be linked to the acquisition of a GRC, then that offence will be considered to have an aggravating factor. What that results in is a harsher sentence, a harsher punishment for those who use the GRC process to commit an offence. Now, it is important that that link has to be made. Another example being if you hold a GRC and commit a criminal offence, a hit and run, theft, for example. The whole, by holding a GRC and committing an offence, the two are clearly uh, unrelated. If the court is confident or has suspicion that the acquisition of a GRC, and by holding a GRC that enabled someone to commit a specific offence, then the aggravating factor could uh, kick in. That's a commonly used mechanism in sentencing. It's used in uh, domestic abuse legislation. It's a concept I introduced during fireworks legislation. And it's a well-tested and well-known concept in courts. Um, it's also been uh, welcomed and received by many stakeholders. If an individual was found to have fraudulently applied for a certificate and or convicted with an aggravated offence, then their certificate would rightly be revoked. Amendment 115 <coughs> Uh, makes for the automatic revocation of a certificate in that scenario. It actually also fixes a loophole where an applicant could have received an interim certificate based on a fraudulent application and was then converting that interim certificate into a full GRC. Uh, yes, uh, just one second. This amendment closes that loophole and brings fraudulent applications for interim GRCs in line with the rest of the bill. Happy to give way to my colleague. Stephen Kerr. <coughs> So is, my colleague, by the way, I pay tribute to the contribution that Jamie Green is making to this whole process and um, the way he's very carefully presenting his views is a credit to him and to the standard of debate that he brings to this chamber. But in relation to the fraud, is the fraud thereby defined as someone obtaining 
the certificate. Mr. Do Kerr, you? Mr. Kerr, sorry, I'd be grateful if you could speak to my. Yeah, it's very I difficult to speak to, to you. This. Thank you. Right, is the fraud when someone seeks to obtain the certificate in order to commit a crime? Is that the definition of the fraud he is presenting in his previous? He didn't want to give specifics, but is that the nature of the fraud he's describing? Jamie Green. Uh, it's, a, it's a helpful question, and actually the answer therein lies in the wording of the amendment itself in Amendment 108. Um, an application for a gender recognition certificate is fraudulent if the applicant knowingly a makes a statutory declaration which is false in a material particular in connection with the application, or b includes information which is false in a material particular in the application. Uh, or a notice of confirmation given under section 8b3 in connection with the application. That's, that's a technical uh, answer. Essentially, um, if someone makes a false statutory declaration, which is a, entirely a distinct possibility, um, then the gender recognition certificate will have been achieved through fraudulent means. That's the first scenario. That in itself is an offence, making a false declaration. If by then receiving a GRC through the normal process, that person then goes on to commit a further offence, for example, a, a sexual offence, offence of sexual violence, violence against another individual, and the court believes that the acquisition of the GRC was a material factor in that offence or a facilitating factor to enable that individual to commit an offence, then that would be an aggravated offence. So it is very likely that it would only be relevant in the scenario where a holder of a GRC commits an offence and the court deems that that offence has been committed and facilitated through the acquisition of a GRC that was acquired through fraudulent means. As I said, um, there are a number of cases, for example, where I, I believe my amendment had it already existed in legislation would have been helpful. Um, but by way of example, the, the uh, presiding officer permits me, there were a number of cases uh, a few years ago um, where um, uh, a number of individuals were convicted of sexual assault, for example. Um, those uh, individuals held GRCs. Um, uh, at the time, uh, and I could, members are welcome to look them up, uh, the Crown versus Barker, uh, McNally, Wilson, Newland, there are a number of cases in this scenario. Um, it, just one second, these, these were trans men who had female partners. It was discovered, uh, the female partner only discovered the identity uh, the transgender identity of the offender um, at the, in, this, in most of these scenarios at the point of intercourse. Those people were then charged and prosecuted duly with sexual offences. Um, there is no aggravating factor in that. They were simply charged as individuals with sexual offences. In this scenario, under these proposals, the courts would look more severely on that because there would be a direct link between that person having obtained the GRC and then committing a, a sexual offence as the nature of it was in that scenario. In my scenario, those people would have received a harsher punishment for that offence because of that link between obtaining a GRC and committing a, an offence of that type. And that's why I believe that these are important and helpful additions to the legislation that doesn't currently exist in the system. I have to give way to that member. Ruth McGuire. Just waiting for the microphone. <laughs> thank you. Um, I thank Jamie Green for taking an intervention. I wonder if I could take him back a little to... I listened carefully when um, he was answering Graham Simpson, and he seemed to say that there was no difference between the previous Act and this Act in terms of evidence, but there is a rather major difference in that um, people would have had a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and I appreciate that we do not wish to have that moving forward, but does that not mean that the evidence that's remaining is a bit arbitrary and, and subjective. I mean, how, how do you prove a fraudulent inquiry if it's about how people feel? Jamie Green. No, I, I, and I respect the, the member's position on this. Um, I mean, it, to be clear, there are people who believe that the process of uh, uh, a gender dysphoria uh, diagnosis is an important part of that process and an important safeguard in that process because clearly evidence must have been submitted to the panel in obtaining a GRC. Um, of course, the change in this legislation is that that is removed. I understand that. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that making a statute of declaration is still an offence. Now, whether or not uh, evidence is submitted or not, 
we have had a, quite a wide-ranging discussion. It's not actually part um, of, of these amendments around um, how one proves that as one is living in an acquired gender. Um, that's been a matter of debate since the 2004 Act. So, um, you know, as I said, the, the scenarios, I mean, these are, these are, of course, hypothetical scenarios. Um, but what, what this amendment does do, and I think it is quite important, is give the court that flexibility that if there is a view taken uh, that, that a statutory declaration was made falsely and that the acquisition of a GRC uh, it enabled and abetted that individual to commit a further offence, then A, the GRC can be revoked and B, any sentence given will be uh, harsher than in any normal scenario of a similar type of offence made by any other individual. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the members' questions, but I'm doing my best here. Uh, essentially what this group of amendments does, and I'll, I'll close on this, is to reintroduce the things that people believe have been taken away through the simplification of the process, and it's to act as a deterrent and it's simply to give a strong message to people that says you cannot use this new process. You cannot abuse this new process for nefarious purposes. If you do, then the law will look harshly upon you. You must know that making a statute of declaration is a solemn and a grave act and move. Making and doing so falsely will be uh, looked upon uh, by the law. And it is not possible, will not be possible, to use this process to then go on to commit further crimes and get away with it. And that's the important point here. Um, what I'm trying to do is reintroduce any perception of a loss in safeguards by introducing things that don't even exist in the current process that will have absolutely no effect on trans people whatsoever who go about their business, who apply for a GRC under due process. These amendments, importantly though, going back to my second point, which I made at the beginning of my comments, is that they are competent. And that is so important in the type of chamber that we have where we are unable to revisit legislation after stage three. They've been legally reviewed, I believe are helpful. I believe they've been welcomed even by those in favor of the legislation. And in my view, they're important because that concept of deterrence is an important one. Thank you. Thank you. I call Rachel Hamilton to speak to amendment 116 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I stand with the comments made by my colleague Jamie Green? I would like to put on record my thanks as well to the parliamentary staff uh, yesterday. Um, can I also um, stand with him on his comments that uh, it is important that we do compromise and uh, that we find uh, shared ground, which I think we did yesterday um, by supporting a number of the government amendments and others uh, from this, these benches. Moving on to my amendment 116, which seeks to make it a criminal offence to, to gain access to a single sex service as a result of having fraudulently obtained a gender recognition certificate to access a single sex space. The amendment seeks to address a key concern of thousands of women and girls who have contacted me, my colleagues and many others in this chamber about the potential unintended consequences of the bill. The provisions of the bill open the ability to obtain a GRC to a much wider and diverse group of people. And the danger that this amendment aims uh, to mitigate relates to the potential for bad faith actors to take advantage of the bill by fraudulently obtaining a GRC. And the right to access single spaces such as changing rooms, hospital wards, religious spaces can be conferred upon by holders of a GRC unless, of course, the service provider is confident that they can legitimately exclude people of protected characteristic. But my fear is that without this amendment, a bad faith actor, as I said, could fraudulently obtain a GRC to access these spaces. And therefore, I believe it's imperative that we criminalise such an act, both to deter people from doing so and to convict, convict those who do so. Um, just on Monday evening, um, the committee, which I sit on, heard evidence from the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, and in relation specifically to the harm that this bill could have on the rights and protections for women and girls. And during her time giving evidence and in her respondent, uh, a correspondence to the committee over the last few months, we've heard that women across the country may have to self-exclude from women-only spaces because of this bill. And we need to take these concerns very seriously. Her expert opinion should not be brushed aside. And I know that she has 
um, consulted widely on this matter and her opin opinion has been well informed. If this bill passes and these concerns are not addressed, I think it's right that the Cabinet Secretary takes the time to explain exactly um, why Mr Salem's comments have been, I suppose, brushed to the side by the Government um, because they address specifically my amendment in this group. We must take our time to listen to those who have warned us in these, this chamber about the dangers of the bill to women's spaces and I sincerely hope that members will reflect on this amendment. I would also like to um, recognise the points made by, um, in interventions by Graham Simpson and uh, Ruth Maguire. Um, a lot of my uh, amendment is based or hangs on some of the amendments that I aimed to achieve yesterday. Um, so I just want to um, respond to the concerns that individuals have. And I, I, I'm not yet sure until I hear from the Cabinet Secretary, presiding officer, uh, whether I will press this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I call Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jamie Green uh, for as always bringing a thoughtful amendment around the, some of the, the actually technical issues around offences and the commission of offences. And I want to look at it from that point of view. So I'm very grateful that he has responded to a question I put to him at stage two. So to prove a commission of any crime, you must show the mental element to the crime and the behavioural element of the crime. So it's impossible to see in someone's mind. So you have to look at the actings of the person to establish what they were thinking. So what is it about the commission of a fraudulent application, such as in this Amendment 108, that would require to be shown? Crucially, this bill is a self-identification model with no specific requirements as to what would constitute living in the gender. And as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out yesterday, the guidance on acquiring gender in the 2004 Act sets out what is required under that Act, which is to gather documentation. But importantly, it must be noted that at the end of that two-year period, it is the panel that then signs off before the declaration. And I think that is an important difference to understand. So when we come to this legislation, I think we need to be clear about what kind of evidence needs to be brought before a court before this offence would be brought uh, before it. So, for example, as I also said at stage two, and I think the member, Jim Green himself, said, well, you could uh, show the commission of the crime by showing that the person didn't really mean to apply for uh, a GRC and hadn't been using the correct pronouns or had, I think, I think he did say something about appearance. But I think because there's nothing on the face of the bill that requires a definition, I don't really think this would be enough. So that's why I'm really interested to probe this question um, so how would you prove such a fraud? And of course, it is pos it's possible to reverse a, a GRC, and rightly so, because people may change their minds. So we do have a provision to reverse it. So my concern would be that uh, there would be a reasonable explanation given. Could, you could use that as a reasonable explanation, having been charged with a fraud under this offence, um, that you changed your mind and you reversed a GRC. I am really just trying to probe at the technical nature of it and to see whether or not it is of any value. I mean, I would say on the balance, I would support having it than not having it. And I would also support having an aggravation because although it might be unclear to us now why it might be needed, I, I, I see uh, rather to have a belt and braces um, than, than uh, anything else. Um, there, is a, there is a requirement under Article 5 of the ECHR to provide legal certainty on how an offence is committed in any act that we pass. Uh, but I am concerned that uh, the answers not only from the Cabinet Secretary got at stage two don't seem to square with the legislation that we're looking at that doesn't actually require any specifics in order to acquire your gender. It's simply a declaration that that's the gender that you wish to be uh, living in now and have your birth certificate aligned. So I'm um, having some difficulty showing how would you prove that to a court. But on the balance, I would say I I'd rather have it in the legislation than not. Thank you. Thank you. I call Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and I think pa Pauline uh, McNeill raises the fundamental questions here. The issue here is if this bill passes as, as it is, so right as it is, somebody just, we have self-ID, we have a system of self-ID. So all you have to do is declare 
or I could declare I'm a woman. I could tell you now I'm a woman. I'm not a woman, but I could be telling you that. You would then, you would then say, well, well, prove it. I don't have to prove it. I all, all I have to do under this bill is say, I'm a woman and apply for a certificate. No evidence required other than me saying I am a woman. So if somebody is to challenge that and say, no, you're not, you have obtained the certificate by fraud, surely then they would have to prove that I'm not a woman. But I've not, I have not had to present any evidence yeah. other than state the fact or not that I'm a woman. So how can we have, how can we have a fraud committed? Now people are looking puzzled by this. I am puzzled by the bill. Yeah. Let me tell you. So we have a situation, and then these well-meaning amendments, and they are well-meaning, yet uh, you want to make an intervention, Mr. Kerr? Stephen Kerr. <coughs> In my intervention to Jamie Green, I suggested that the only fraud possible would be someone obtaining a GRC for the purposes of some nefarious act they, they had in mind to perform or commit. Would you agree? Graeme Simpson. Well, I agree that is a risk in the bill. That is, that is one of the problems with the bill. But how do you prove it if no evidence is required to obtain one of these certificates and that's something that, that many of us or several of us have been trying to tackle uh, in the amending stages at stage two and stage three unsuccessfully so we're left with a bill which requires no evidence just self id so how then can you have a, fr a fraud committed or you know unless you can prove that i have lied and why why would i own up to that but somebody has to prove it in court. Yeah. Why, you know, if you're going to have the... Yes? Ash Regan. Would the member agree with me that evidence suggests that the risk of getting caught committing an offence is a very effective part of deterrence? Graham Simpson. Correct. That would be a t deterrent. So where's the risk here? There is very little risk because of, because of the situation I've outlined where no evidence required to obtain a certificate, how, how can the police, if they got involved, how would the police be able to prove anything? Yes. Brian Whittle. Very grateful for, for Graham Smith for taking intervention and actually I've been wrestling this with that exact point since speaking to a policeman the other day who said to me that if a trans gender person walked into the opposite toilet and was challenged by somebody in that, that toilet, one of those two people is committing an offence. How do they tell the difference? Graham Simpson. Precisely. Precisely. That is the point. A very point. A good point. Well made by Mr Whittle, as I would expect. And so these, these all the amendments in this group very well-meaning and they would work if, if obtaining a gender certificate required you to produce some evidence because then you could disprove the evidence but we're not asking that so unfortunately for me none of these amendments work and I would urge the members uh, not to press them thank you I call the cabinet secretary Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I just put on record uh, my thanks to Parliament, uh, Parliament staff for the, the very late sitting uh, last night. Um, it was very much appreciated by members across the Chamber. Uh, at stage two, uh, Jamie Green lodged an amendment to introduce a new statutory aggravator of an offence connected to uh, fraudulently obtaining a, a gender recognition certificate. At the time, I supported Jamie Green's amendment with the caveat that it would require some adjustment at stage three. Uh, I'm grateful to Jamie Green for working with me to develop the updated wording in Amendment 114. The introduction of a statutory aggravator supplements the other safeguards in the bill and provides additional assurance against misuse of the system. 
Jamie Green's other amendments in this group also strengthen the bill, and I am happy to support them. Uh, revocation was already possible through an application to a sheriff, but making it automatic in the case of conviction is sensible and appropriate, uh, as uh, he does here. And therefore, I support all the amendments in this group in uh, Jamie Green's name. Uh, I do not support Amendment 116 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, which specifically creates an offence of gaining fraudulent access to single-sex services. The bill already creates an offence of making a false application uh, with penalties identical to those in Rachel Hamilton's amendment. Under Jamie Green's amendments, there will also be an aggravator of an offence connected with a fraudulently obtained GRC. Um, yes. Tess White. The Cabinet Secretary. Could the Cabinet Secretary please just say what safeguards uh, would be put in place to, to prevent those who fraudulently obtained a GRC from accessing women's only spaces? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. So, first of all, the protections under the Equality Act that have uh, exceptions for single sex services spaces are there and are unchanged by this bill. Um, and therefore, um, anyone who would be entering a, a service, for example, for victims of, of sexual assault that was uh, for uh, women only and could exclude trans women, if a trans woman uh, was to try and enter that space, then it would be a, an offence under the common law, like breach of the peace, for example. If they were then, because they may be a genuine trans woman, trying to enter a, a service that excludes them, right? So in that circumstance, that would be. If they, are, they have a GRC under fraudulent uh, and have made a false application, then clearly that is what is dealt with uh, through these provisions. And it is a very serious offence with uh, up to two years in prison and uh, an unlimited fine in the circumstances uh, that uh, would be uh, covered. Uh, brief briefly. whole concept of applying fraudulently means. So will the Cabinet Secretary spell out for, all of the, for the benefit of all of us, what exactly does this offence amount to of, a, of applying fraudulently for a GRC? How, how do you define it? Cabinet Secretary. And how do you prove it? So, for, for example, uh, someone, a person of interest, would be able to go to the sheriff, for example, and provide evidence, uh, enough evidence that the sheriff themselves would look into whether the person was uh, living in the acquired gender. And uh, essentially, uh, they would have to be able to demonstrate that they've been living in the acquired gender as per the guidance under the 2004 Act. At the, the end of the day, like any other, hang on a minute, li like any other. A case in court, the sheriff would look at the circumstances of the case. And if it was found that the person had made a false application, uh, looking at the circumstances of the case, then clearly they would then face the penalties for making that false uh, uh, declaration. And if they then went on to commit a crime, which is what these amendments deal with, uh, and it was shown that part of the crime involved them having obtained falsely a gender recognition certificate, then there would be an aggravator uh, to that crime. I think this is a sensible set of amendments that strengthen the safeguards that are already in the bill. And I would ask members to support the amendments in the name of Jamie Green, uh, but to reject the amendment in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Jamie Green to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 108. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and can I thank members for their contributions. Um, it's, it is a debate, and uh, we on these benches are happy to have these debates, I'm pleased to say. Um, I just would say three points, really, uh, as these amendments, are, I believe, are, from a legal point of view, self-explanatory. They're lengthy, and uh, just if I could make a little bit of progress, then I will. Thank you. I, d I do want to say three things. Uh, the point, first point made by Polly McNeill is that I would rather there's something in the bill than nothing. I, I agree with that sentiment. I believe that the something that introduced at stage two had technical and legal issues, and I've sought to resolve those. Um, without the assistance of certainly anyone in these benches, I've resorted to getting assistance from legal advice from elsewhere to try and make them competent. 
uh, and I believe they are competent, or at least I'm advised they're competent. As is always the case with these things, such as aggravators that exist in other pieces of legislation, they're often not, uh, we often don't know until they're tested in courts and, and in specific cases, and they're, they're put through their, their, their uh, rigorous testing in that scenario. Um, I, 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 did, I do have sympathy with the, the notion that there is a spectrum of having nothing on the face of the bill that states what that criteria is around uh, what constitutes an offence and having a, a large range of specificity about it. And, and somewhere in the middle might have been a better balance. So I, I, you know, I, do, I do understand that, and that's an issue that I wrestled with myself ahead of this amendment. Um, the second point, though, is uh, members are, of course, as is their prerogative, if they don't support them or they don't agree with them or they think they're poorly worded, don't vote for them. That is the point of today's session. But the third point is a theme that I've maybe picked up in, and that's the conflation of this with, uh, with the other clearly parallel issue of that of self-identification, which is, a, again, a very valid debate to, to be had. On the first point, yeah, yeah, on the first point, sure. Liam Kerr. I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> Just if I may take the member back to the legal points, because I'm really struggling um, with... I, I just didn't hear an answer from the Cabinet Secretary. We're talking about fraud here, which is a criminal offence. And it seems to me that if that's right, then proving it requires the act of doing this, but it also requires the mens rea, the intention. And what I'm really struggling with here is to understand what could be adduced what evidence could be brought forward that would show, that would prove beyond reasonable doubt that intention? Because I'm not hearing that so far. Jamie Green. Yeah, and, and, and the, the member you know, makes a, a very valid point. Um, I, you know, the, the, the idea that um, it, to prove that someone has made a statutory, false statutory declaration or, or fraudulently obtained a GRC um, clearly um, is a matter for the court to decide. Um, now, it, there will be uh, evidence given that, that, and again, it's difficult to foresee that because it so rarely happens. And indeed, since 2004, I believe, it's so rare, rarely been tested uh, in court because it already <coughs> is possible to get a GRC and already is possible uh, and an offence to make a, a false st statute declaration. So um, I don't have a huge amount of case study precedent to refer to. Uh, it would have been helpful if I did, actually. Um, but. The, 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 there, there are, you know, in my view, and I don't want to preempt what court's criteria might look at, but the scenario where someone has uh, made a declaration and clearly has done so falsely would include some of the factors I raised in my opening statement. For example, it could be proven uh, demonstrably that that person had not been living in their quiet agenda. There, there are ways of doing so. Um, yeah, no, one second. I want to answer the other member's point first. Um, there are clearly manifest manifested ways that one can do that and that is as, as, as I stated in the opening comments around uh, that of not living in one's acquired agenda for the period defined. Um, for example, physical evidence of not using uh, pronouns that are claimed to be uh, attributed to the acquired agenda of uh, that of uh, those of evidence given from those who know the offender who also believe that the declaration was made false that evidence could be used uh, in, in a court. And, and as, as, as stated in uh, Amendment 114, um, the evidence from a single source is sufficient to prove that an offence is aggravated by a connection of a GRC obtained by fraud. And that would be a matter for the court in that case at that time to decide. If they were so moved that they do not believe that that, uh, uh, that case has been made, um, then that would be a matter for the court. Um, did another member have an intervention? Yeah, sure. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, General. Can I thank Mr Green for taking this intervention? This is the intervention I wanted to ask the Cabinet Secretary. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to what you're trying to do here. But the test within a criminal trial is beyond reasonable doubt. It's a very high test that a sheriff would have to take in regard to that. And I, I am still struggling to follow on perhaps for Mr Simpson and Mr Kerr, is what evidence can the Crown bring in any case that would reach that test of beyond reasonable doubt? And I think there's a real danger here that we are making a law that could never be enforced. And is, is that a good way for us to be moving forward? Jamie Green. 
It may never be enforced, but could be enforced, uh, Mr Balfour, and that's the point. Is, is it is important that it exists so that in such a scenario it could be enforced. Now, that will... I, I hope it doesn't, because if it does, then it, it shows that, that the system has been abused. But if we are in that scenario where it is tried and tested and put to the test, then, as, as the member rightly said, it would be a matter for the court to decide, if beyond reasonable doubt, the case has been made, that a declaration was false and that the aggravator is so relevant. Um, and, and I have every faith uh, uh, in, in the judiciary to make that decision based on the evidence that is provided by both those prosecuting and those defending. Um, and that's, that's, that's common in, in a number of factors. As I said, this, this could be related in many ways to the legislation this Parliament passed uh, around uh, aggravators that exist around uh, domestic abuse, where in that, for example, for example uh, the abuser was uh, using children as a means, for example, to uh, further traumatise the victim. And in that scenario, uh, the court, on the balance of the whole, would decide that that's an aggravating factor. So this is it's not an unusual concept. I, I appreciate if members aren't happy with uh, as it's worded, but are sympathetic to the, the, the notion of it, and I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, all I can do is try my best to word things in a way with advice that I get that, that make them competent, and I'm, I'm sure they are. But again, all of this would be tested uh, in, in courts in the unlikely scenario that this came to a court. The underlying principle, and this is a point I do want to make though, is that the principle, the underlying principle behind it, what I, was, what I am trying to achieve is to improve the scenario that there is a greater deterrent, you know? That perception of uh, dropped safeguards as a result of simplification of the process, whether you agree with the new process or not, is that if in any way any member who's will, who can submit amendments, and we're all welcome to submit amendments, can introduce something that tries to improve the deterrent aspect of this to say no you cannot use this new process for nefarious purposes and if you do the law uh, will, will, will take that very seriously and that's the underlying premise of it if i haven't achieved that and you don't think i've achieved that don't vote for it if you do please do what i cannot fix though is if members have problems with the concept of self-id that's not a problem i can fix that is your personal view N no I, I think i've probably said enough on this um pardon well, um, you're, I will give way then. Ruth McGuire. I just, I just wanted to be really clear. I, I was not making a point about self-identification in itself. I was just pointing out the difference between the two systems and asking how evidence would be proven. I mean, people may have a concern um, that folk will be wrongly accused. I think, I mean, I, I get that prosecution is the business of the prosecution service, but laws are business and we need to be really clear what we're legislating for. So it's, I, I really was not making a point about self-ID. I was talking about your amendments. Jamie Green. First of all, I, I didn't refer to the member by name and, and, or, or, or glance in our direction in general. That comment is not directed at any individual members. I'm making a point, though, and I think it's fair to say it'd be unusual for me not to point out that there are members in the room who do not agree with the change that the legislation proposes as a matter of principle. I understand that and I respect that as much as uh, members respect my position on this. I'm not, I'm not accusing the member of saying that. The, the member does make a, a very valid point, and that, that is that people may be wrongly accused of such matters. That, therefore, as is the case in any uh, criminal case, would be a matter for the defence to make that case and the prosecution to prove it and the court to make a judgment. That's the whole point of the independent judiciary. Now, if, if I have confidence in it, other members uh, may, may have less. Um, but I, I do make that point that members who have a problem with the change in the process, the reduction in the living and acquired gender, the threshold of evidence that needs to be given as a result of that, the removal of the panel, all of these things that this bill does, if you have a problem with those, that's fine. Uh, th this amendment doesn't alter that, it doesn't affect that, and it won't change any of that. People with opposition to that will still have opposition to that. All I'm trying to do is improve the bill by adding in what I believe is a much needed deterrent, and I'd be happy to move them when it comes to it. Thank you, presiding officer. Yes. Can I just confirm, um, Mr Green, that your intention is to press Amendment 108? It is. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Um, the Parliament is not agreed, therefore there will be a division, and as this is the first division of the day, I suspend for five minutes.